In this video, I'm going to show you how a group that trained with less volume and less intensity still managed to get some of the best strength gains in a study, which is likely the precursor to the 10-5-3 LSUS program. But before I get into actual content, let's take a look at who is actually a part of this study. The first person I'm going to mention is Kyle Pierce. Kyle Pierce is the coach of Kendrick Ferris, who went to the Olympics three times. He is also at some point picked up on being the head coach of the Ghana weightlifting team, actually. So he has a lot of experience coaching weightlifting. He was also a lifter himself, and I think he was a football player at one point. I think he got into weightlifting as a way to enhance himself as an athlete for football. Um, but now he strictly coaches, I believe. I'm not sure he competes anymore. So the next person on the list is Mike Stone. If you've ever picked up a bodybuilding magazine, Around late 1990s and early 2000s, you probably heard of Mike Stone at some point. I knew of Mike Stone before I ever even read a single piece of real research. But his credentials are around the corner, and his wife is also a former two-time Olympian in the discus. So this guy is really one of, as they say, he's one of the best minds in strength and conditioning, and um, one of the most notable. He's fascinating to listen to. If you ever get to see some of his uh, his uh, videos online I would check them out there's some people who have recordings of him doing speeches at, uh, at conventions and it's just awesome if it doesn't open up your mind on how to train and what's possible and, and what's going on during training I suggest if you have that hour to take that time and even take notes because sometimes you forget what he says and you wonder but this guy is top-notch Okay, so here's a basic outline of the TENS block that was going around in uh, around the mid-2000s to the late 2000s around the Olympic lifting forums. So if you're around those forums, you've probably seen these kinds of pictures posted up. Sean Hutchinson has a really good breakdown. I'll include the link in the description of his original file and his comments. He trained under the system, so he outlined it for the most part. The one thing that wasn't clear about it is the rest between sets, but, um, you know, I tried doing this type of stuff with two roughly two and a half minutes rest between sets my muscles were toast <laughs> toast I mean I've never hurt so bad in my life than doing three sets of ten like this where meaning like what you're trying to do is you're just trying to get three good sets of ten this is how it was originally explained to me and the idea is to basically work up or warm up to a ten rep max okay from there what you do is you cut about enough weight so that you can get another tough 10 in and then on your third set after some rest you take enough weight off to get another tough 10 in so it's three solid grinding sets of 10 from everything that I was told at least that's how I used to do it when I was trying to apply this to calisthenics and um, yeah it's it's brutal it's brutal but it produces results and since this is a periodization scheme, it's followed up by a 5 rep max block and a 3 rep max block conducted in the same fashion and the same type of percentage drops. Uh, just to make something really quick, that this will be included in the description link, but the minus 5% and the minus 10% basically means that the second set should be within 5% of the original top set load, and the third set should be within 10% of your top rep max load, just to make that clear. Okay, so here's the study that was done back in 2000. Comparison of the effects of three different weight training programs on one repetition maximum squat. So you can see it was done a very long time ago, and we'll take a look at how they trained. So here we have the training protocols for each of the three groups. So now the first group basically trained using a six rep max on the main lifts and an eight rep max on the assistance lifts. The other group, the second group, was the basic 10-5-3 breakdown over the course of the 12 weeks. The third group was was a very similar 10-5-3 breakdown except they had heavy and light days in between or within the weeks and they were supposed to be termed an overreaching group but I I really can't put two and two together on what actually makes that an overreaching group except for the fact that it seems to incorporate a 10 rep max uh, period just before it gets into what's mostly a 5 rep max I don't know I don't know I don't understand exactly how this is overreaching compared to the other groups but it is what it is Okay, so here's the ultimate results, and essentially, group 3 gained the most strength, followed by group 2, and followed by group 1 in last place. Group 1 gained 14 kilograms on the squat, group 2 gained 18.5 kilograms on the squat, and 20.5 kilograms was gained by group 3. Now, aside from the absolute strength, 
It's interesting to note that Group 1 gained the most body weight, but yet did not gain the most absolute strength. So essentially, Groups 3 and 2 became pound for pound stronger. And if you look down at the second column from the bottom, it says squats times kilogram inverted. So what that basically means is how much did the squat increase per kilogram of body weight? And if you pay attention to that, uh, group two and group three, both of the periodization groups, got significantly stronger, and their Sinclair scores went up significantly higher than group one. Okay, so let's look at some of the potential implications for this data. Going back to table number four, you can see that the group that used the highest amount of volume was group one, and yet they gained the least amount of strength. So volume is not exclusively tied to strength gains or absolute one rep max strength gains. Uh, in terms of programming. But group number two to me was one of the most interesting because they used the least amount of volume and the least intensity at only 61% average one rep max. And yet they still did almost as good as group three, which trained at a significantly higher intensity. I think this is what led Mike Stone to make some comments in the past about how it's not just the loading it's also how you manipulate the variables. That's very, very important. And when you look at variation, group three had the most, especially within the week where they would reduce the load by 15% in order not to go to failure. Okay, so I hope everyone got a little bit of information from this video and hopefully this opened some eyes and some possibilities in the way you can train. The reason why I'm comfortable with making some video on 10.5.3 is because I've loaded this way and really one of the best ways I've ever done it. I've never been stronger throughout a dynamic range between a one rep max and a 14 rep max. Not saying it's the very best, but it's the best I've ever done. Not the best I've ever done isometrically, but in terms of dynamic, all around dynamic strength between a one rep max and a 14 rep max and not getting injured and not suffering with my joints, it's the best I've ever had. And um, I think primarily it's due to the volume cuts and kind of allowing my body to reset while at the same time keeping the intensity high enough to maintain some of the, the fitness I've gained while dissipating the fatigue. But anyways, that's about it. For, you know, Hopefully everybody has a good weekend and uh, stay strong and injury-free.